Um, okay, you guys. Hey. 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 Welcome to Creative Happy Hour. Where we get drunk. On the creative hap- <laughs> <laughs> The creative, creative possibilities. I can't even talk. <laughs> I haven't even had a drink yet. All right? Seriously. Okay, yeah. It's happy hour. Where it we is. get drunk on the creative possibilities. That's what we do. And today, we are drinking Duchess. Duchess. Um, otherwise known as the Duchess. It's an, yeah, otherwise known as the Duchess. It's an authentic sour cherry ale. It's got some chick with a bird on it. I like it. Yeah, it she's very Vermeer-esque. Yeah, she's very Vermeer-esque, and it's from Belgium. So Ver, we're all about... Verheg Vigde. Right? We're all about the Flemish and Dutch masters, because we're going to be talking about landscape, yes. environment, and creativity. Yes. Yes. So what are we going to be saying about that? We're going to say, how have creatives over time represented their environment? We're going to say, what are the ways that creatives shape their environment? And finally, I'm going to give you guys some tips on how to make your environment more creative, Ooh. more conducive to creativity every day. You're so like we're... a creative landscape right? architect. Oh my God, totally. So we're going to open this shit, this sour this. cherry ale. I can't even open it. I'm like stupid. Do we need... <laughs> Do we need tools? You need your drag on. Oh, yeah. Okay, got it. Wait, wait. You do? I'm using my shirt to open it. This I'm like so... scared. I'm like, ah. Uh -huh. Ah. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared. Oh. I feel like I need a corkscrew oh, or a no. man. You need a man. You need I a never man. need man hands like I have. Yeah. I, I cannot get this thing open. You can do it by cranking it with like your, I think my hands are, you're, you got baby hands. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here, I'm going to I'm gonna do it. Come on, that. Mommy, help me. Okay, help me, help me, Mommy. Okay, here it goes. Man hands. Man hands. Oh, shit. Okay, oh, here. yeah, that's a nice I'm a sound. professional. Okay, you guys. Yeah, girl. So, cheers to you. Cheers. To you and the cheers Duchess. to the Duchess and to, and to the, the masters and the landscape masters and the environment, all that good shit. Let's go. Hmm. Wow, that is sour, right? Wow. <laughs> they didn't lie. I was thinking there'd be more like cherry in the sour cherry ale. This is like just sour ale, right? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Um, I'm going to drink it. I'm going to drink it. Well, we're going to drink it. That's it, what we're going to do. It, it's, been that it, kinda, it's been that kind of day. It's been that kind of day. Right? It's been that yeah. kind of week, frankly. Well, today we're filming actually midweek. We're filming on hump mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. instead of Monday um, because we've had that kind of week. That's just the way it's been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the landscape has been. Listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink it. I yeah, mean, it's not bad. But it tastes like, you know what it tastes like? It tastes like really strong kombucha with like apple cider vinegar. Yeah. And like then they carbonated it just a little bit. Yeah. But it's good because I was afraid it was gonna be too cloying. I thought it was gonna it's be not sweet. Me and too. I was not. I it's mean, definitely you, like not the sweet. lambic. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had the lambic? A um, long time ago. The Belgian, um, the right. Belgian lambic. That is very sweet. See, I'm glad this isn't. I was afraid it would be. Yeah. I was afraid and you it was maybe get, like, like totally the like... first couple sips. Yeah. And then it's and then too you're like, sweet and you're no. just like, I and then you know, get trashed. Exactly. You get yeah. trashed from the sugar, yeah. which I kind of freaking hate. So, mm. anyway, now that we've gotten the alcohol out of the way and, and oh, we're going to keep, we're gonna keep putting it, it, we're going to keep putting, putting it away. It away. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about environment. So, you were the first one who pushed this environment landscape theme on us. And I want to know. <laughs> why you wanted to do that I mean, well, I the love the theme, so but. the reason I thought about it is because and I hate to bring up a sore topic but mm -hmm. you were planning your trip yes, to, to Iceland, Iceland. Mm -hmm. and I visited Iceland years ago mm -hmm. and you know and I I was very intrigued by the landscape of Iceland I mean Iceland right. is has you know is the size of Kentucky yeah. and it has I don't even know, like 21 active volcanoes or something. Right. It's got a ton of it's got a ton. going on. Yeah, this. so it's yeah. kind of like one big geyser activity, mm -hmm. you know, and it's mm -hmm. like fire and ice kind of thing. Right. And so I felt compelled creatively. I wanted to do kind of a fiber rug series nice. of fiber and I, you know. Um, and, and I'm actually going to tell you Fiber and ice. I wanted to do like See? red and gray and charcoal and like, yeah, the like lava. I wanted to do lava and like bright blues and cool. and just, you know, I was very inspired by the landscape. And then, and I, and I think a lot, <laughs> and then, yeah, and then life <laughs> fucking happened and I never did it. Um, but, but I, I will do I it. That. Yeah. I will do it. I love that. Well, though, that's cool that you felt compelled by that landscape because I actually have reasons why certain landscapes 
inspire more than others. So well, and kind of you, you know, and through. so when I was thinking about you going on this trip mm -hmm. and we, you know, I was like, oh no, what are we going to do? We're not going to be able to film. And, right. and so I, I was saying to you, you know, think about landscape and how right. you're affected by right. it while you're on uh -huh. this trip. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not just, when I think of landscape, I don't just think of like land mass and the way it looks, but I think right. of kind of the cultural mm -hmm. phenomenon that, that builds around landscapes. Yeah, so, you know, absolutely. you get different kinds of foods in certain landscapes. You get different right. kind of smells. You get different clothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, people dress differently and different. You know, you, culture is kind of built on whatever's available exactly. in a certain landscape. Yeah. And therefore, it kind of infuses into... Right. Like, you'll have that the minimalism psychology. and yeah. the maximalism. Yeah. And then you'll have, yeah, the spicy versus bland mm -hmm. and all of that interesting stuff. Well, I, I kind of love that. I went down the whole rabbit hole of landscape painting and yeah. also landscape architecture and landscape installations. Because I was just like, oh, I'm going to do all this research. And, yeah. you know, the reason we're having this whole um, Belgian Dutch thing is because... You know, people didn't always make landscape the center of their art, which is kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, like when we think of art, we often think of landscapes. Yeah. And that's kind of a later phenomenon. I mean, it used to be that landscapes were there to be a background for whatever else is there. Right. And, you know, there was this whole thing of not representing nature, you know, doing things that were more symbolic or doing more people. And that was the focus. Mm-hmm. But when landscape painting kind of happened to, you know, started to be really big, it was the Dutch, the Flemish. Um, they, those were the masters who were doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting. And I think... Was it because they were traveling and they wanted to... They, well, they were traders. They did have a lot of that industry. Uh. And I think, though, that they had these landscapes with a lot of sky and a lot of flat land. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something about, like... Almost all landscape painting includes sky and lots of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that any landscape painting where you see less sky, that's going to be a game. It's going to be like a perception thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be kind of pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. So I think basically like it was all about composition. It was kind of like this philosophical um, religious thing mm -hmm. about creation. It was this whole philosophical discourse about what's there and it's all about harmony. Yeah. You know, so I thought that that was really quite fascinating. Yeah. And then the colors were tended to be kind of muted, you know, grays and greens and blues, you know, that kind of were those soothing creative mm -hmm. colors. So I thought that was pretty cool. So those landscape paintings started becoming known, you know, when before it was more portraiture, Right. More religious subject matter. But then it started being about creation, right? Yeah, about creation. Mm -hmm. And then I think also landscapes are kind of windows yes. into another ambiance or a different Absolutely. space. So mm -hmm. if you have, you know, a room and you have a landscape of a forest or you have a landscape, mm -hmm. you know, that's of a, a desert or a, whatever. Yeah, or like a cottage in a village or I, I don't know, whatever the landscape yeah. is you kind of get transported totally psychologically totally. Yeah, like by little that. Allegories are little, yeah, like, yeah, little, like little, little windows into yeah. other spaces. Absolutely. And, and I think that if you look at a lot of the early Belgium and um, Belgium and um, Dutch paintings, most mm. of them seem to be kind of spring-like mm. themes. And then they started playing on the seasons. And that yeah. was kind of a play of being, it was all about change. So, you know, they started using the landscapes as kind of a discourse on what was going on. So yeah. you had, for example, we were talking last week about the triumph of death. Yeah. And that's a really barren, like there's, you know, the landscape is not the main point in that painting. Right. But what there is of the landscape is super barren. It's all brown. Yeah. It's all trampled. It's, it's burnt. It's, it's dead. deadly. It's yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you have like, you know, since the default was the blues, the greens and the, you know, mm. the, the greenery, when you have a winter scene or a dead scene, that's saying a major thing. That was like the big right. reach. Right. So then when you start going and then there was also like Chinese art and Japanese art, you know, yeah. and that's kind of that permanence. Like a lot of them were like Mount Fuji or things, scenes like that, that are like these almost... They're almost mystical. They're mystical. Yeah. They are. They're like deities of nature, you know, Mount yeah. Fuji as this god of permanence yeah. kind of thing. And, you know, or or something, or on the contrary, 
the cherry blossoms and the cherry blossoms being so ephemeral. Right. And, you know, and that whole thing is about, And you're you know, capturing it. I mean, it's, you're it's kind of, something. Yeah. it's kind of, yeah. And you're talking about that change, you know, when the trees flower, it's, yes. it's fleeting. It's only there exactly. for a period of time. Yeah. And then there's a different season. Exactly. And so it's kind of the pre- photography absolutely so is, yeah so is I, the landscape exactly and because I, now you're like you know we were coming out of target and there was this incredible sunset ooh, on yeah mount tam and uh -huh. my daughter's like oh i'm gonna take a picture yeah and the target parking lot by the way in marin county yeah, is kind of spectacular it kind of is it's, kind it's of the like, best it's kind target. of like landscape pan it, 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 it is like the best why there isn't a bunch of people out there painting landscapes all the time i'm, I'm shocked but people Just take people. photos there all the time yeah they're out there stunning. smoking weed and seriously it's a nice it's a nice ass parking lot um with Marin County, we have that. Well, we do have those that whole California Impressionist thing. So I, I was going to say that once you kind of move away from these classical mm -hmm. landscape paintings, then you move through these different styles. So you had kind of the English watercolor paintings. Yeah. And that brought in a whole other ephemeral side because the, the properties of the watercolor itself mm -hmm. is really the artist having to manipulate this difficult medium mm -hmm. to portray something that is so ephemeral as well, that is so fleeting. So mm -hmm. I thought that that was kind of fascinating. I'm also thinking of the... Um the like hunting English oh hunting. absolutely the hunt scenes yeah yeah and then the Hudson River School with like the hunting and fishing so it's yeah. kind of like man's interaction with the environment yeah and like if you look at a bunch of the early American landscape paintings and even the early European like kind of in the age of exploration mm -hmm. whenever there is a human figure in it the human figure is like super dwarfed by mm -hmm. the landscape you know and mm -hmm. it used to be the opposite right it mm -hmm. used to be the portrait is in front mm -hmm. with a tiny landscape in the back. And now you move on to the landscape being the main thing with the that humans is being kinda, there for scale. That is kind of interesting. I oh, mean, yeah. that is kind of like the first step that we took into globalization in a way. It's totally. Like Starting we to see went that we're not from, the center. Yeah, mm -hmm. we went from the individual to the landscape. I mean, yeah. how we, we became, how we're, we kind of identify as part of landscape. Totally. Yeah. We start to see ourselves as not as the center of the earth, right? But like, you know, this little thing. And we start to see our scale and our lack of importance. So I thought that was well, super. Some people did. Some people did. Some people think they're all that. <laughs> and a bag of chips. <laughs> and a bag of chips. So there you go. So then you have, um, then you had the whole thing about romanticism. Mm. And again, that's really the landscape kind of sublimating these figures. And it's the idealized landscape mm -hmm. and kind of going back to this concept of Arcadia. Mm. You know, and yeah. Arcadia being this whole, um, basically a locus mundi or a locus aminus, which is like kind of the landscape being the starting point for a story or some kind of mm. idealized mm -hmm. trope of mysticism and myth, right? Like like the mist of Avalon. Kind oh, of. totally. Like anything. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mist like of, Camelot. Camelot. Well, like, yeah, like yeah. idealized, like that idea yeah. of, you know, anything where you have the shepherds and Yeah, all you stuff. always it's have a picture in your mind. When perfect. you think of those stories, there's a landscape Absolutely. associated oh, with completely. the Oh, completely. There are little sheep in it. There are yeah. little flora, flowering trees, mm -hmm. three graces dancing around in a garden and all mm -hmm. that shit. So, and, and the gar so then when you start thinking about the garden and this is kind of an aside, cause we'll talk about it more at first, you know, when you start having like kind of pictures of gardens and mm -hmm. pictures of these, um, you know, uh, cloisters and things like that, mm -hmm. that's kind of the first part that you see of man's influence on nature and man right. putting their imprint on that whole landscape and that's a major time in history you know when it comes to the representation yeah, of that like for it, sure at first it wasn't art at first to really show buildings except the palladiums would show because they were really mm -hmm. into their architecture right They're showing how that you know creation of man being almost more important than the landscape itself right. it's a so yeah, yeah so you're a seeing, contrast exactly so um then we start to see the um so then we go to, to Europe where we've got um, basically 19th century is when the landscapes were really like kind of mm -hmm. where it was at. That was just major. And then you move to the whole Barbizon school. And this is when you start to do the plein air painting where you're actually outside painting. Because before right. you in your studio, painting something that was sublimated and kind of imaginary. And it's funny because in China, there's a whole tradition where some people who are kind of intellectual mm -hmm. would be painting these idealized landscapes, mm -hmm. whereas the more like peasanty ones are actually painting what they see. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. 
And so because the, if you're doing if you're doing a landscape, I mean, you're downloading it from memory because yes. you didn't necessarily have a photo, or of you're it. inventing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's that whole inventio versus. Um, uh, you had the what was it called? You had translatio, which is actually replicating something mm-hmm. completely, or inventio, which is you're using your imagination mm. or kind of the work of those before you. And so that's really fascinating because that's quite a come off. And, yeah. and, and then you start getting into the intellectual art and the high art versus the low art. And I think that the differences were very different at different points in history right. versus now. You know, like if you look at Impressionist time when they were painting outside, yeah. you know, or in cafes, I think some of the Impressionist things might have been seen as very rebellious working class type of paintings. Well, yeah, I mean, think of some of Van Gogh's landscape paintings Mm -hmm. and how they are almost cartoonish Mm -hmm. in nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, it's almost like with those paintings, and I'll never know because I'm not going to be able to talk to Van Gogh. (laughs) Damn it. Damn it. (laughs) And we were going to have him on the show, but Right, we were. His his publicist um, said no. Yeah, he said no. He's he's, uh, He's uh, otherwise engaged. (laughs) But, um... No, but I mean, you, you almost want to ask him, like, what, you know, are you, are you, like, are you trying to say that we're landscape in your mind is another dimension or something? I and mean, it's almost yeah. like, it's almost like digitalized some of his painting techniques. Right. Where well, you feel Van like. very different than, he was, he was the beginning of the whole abstract landscape because right. like the, the impressionists were trying to catch something that was so fleeting right and their whole method of trying to really literally capture that light in the microsecond whereas i think van gogh was saying this is my this is my experience this is my distillation of yeah this is my experience it's more of like a a subliminal yes completely i don't have a subliminal but like a subconscious yeah experience of landscape totally and then downloading it and being like this is the way i see it whereas i think somebody like monet was like this is the way i saw the light on this particular day don't you see it by standing back like yeah. don't you get that and that was the goal there so i mean i just think it's pretty fascinating and then but then you start having things where people are trying to make you know these real statements like i think of david hockney where he's yeah. painting this whole lifestyle within the landscape like the swimming pool and that's right, like right, that right. quintessential LA thing with yeah. like the, the swimming pool being the whole point with a little bit of greenery around. Yeah, and you and can that actually light. And right? you can kind of smell the heat of yes. the day when oh you look God, at yes. those paintings. I mean Absolutely. It's absolutely and, and that's I think I think that's essentially what we want our creative happy hour yachts to think about <laughs> is how does landscape mm-hmm. affect you creatively, right? Completely. I mean and, like well, and how what is yeah. it, what is it that you experience from your landscape, what do you draw from from your landscape? Right, and then from the representation of landscape as seen by others, you know, because yeah. that's pretty like with with Hockney. What cracks me up is that he was doing these swimming. He's an English artist. Mm-hmm. He's doing these quintessential LA swimming pools. He's actually in LA. You can almost, and you're right. Yeah. You can feel the heat. You can you can, you can smell the yeah. sunscreen. Absolutely, you can. Like there's something and, like, but it's temperature for me. I yeah, get temperature. It's hot. It's hot. The yeah. light is hot. Yeah. Um, and then the funny thing is when Hockney moved back to England and mm-hmm. started doing English landscapes, they just lost all, like, okay, it's still a Hockney. So therefore, and- perhaps we could say that he's very inspired by this mm-hmm. L.A. swimming pool scene. Absolutely. Well, uh, so many artists actually congregate to California, especially L.A., actually, yeah. because of the quality of the light. Yeah. Um, I went to this. It is. Yeah, yeah, it's the light. It's the light. And I always Did say you that. watch their, I, and I, it's called Abstract. It's on Netflix, and it's the Dutch guy, and he... Oh God, I'm gonna have to. Like, I'll, I'll, have to I'll have to. Um, I'll have to show it to you because I thought of Perfect. it at the time, but okay. pretty brilliant. But he does at one point talk about he has a show mm-hmm. in LA, and he was talking about the uniqueness of the light. It's it's LA. amazing. It's it's unique. It's absolutely unique, and yeah. it's something that for me when I moved away from LA. It physically pained me to not have that light. It was so oh, bizarre, and I knew that that's what it was. So yeah. I would say that as a creative, like, why don't you see what are those kind of landscape and climactic and light based environmental factors that really feed your soul? As yeah, a creative? where do because you go? It's to important. Be inspired yeah. by your landscape. Yeah, like I so, mean, you think yeah. of George O'Keefe. I mean, oh my gosh, she flowered, blossomed you know, in that desert area. Yeah. 
New yeah, Mexico, that's, yeah, that's where she um, found her shit. Yeah, that's where she found her meaning. And I think what people, so many people will tell you as a creative, they're like, oh no, you should be happy wherever you are. You should, you should flower wherever you're planted. Yeah. No, fuck that because it's not. You know, I am a delicate flower. I need exactly the right <laughs> conditions. And if you know what those conditions are, yeah, you know, try to, you know, just kind of go with that. I think that that's. Well, I also Super think key. it's it's good to put yourself in challenging landscapes. And oh my challenge, God, yeah. You know, it's like going to New York can be really stimulating or go or know, overstimulating. Overstimulating, and, and you, can, you know, yeah. and, and that's kind of, a, I mean, we talked about this before where, you know, when you design your house compared to the design of, you know, I had lots of, when I was um, selling Reclaim, yeah. boring, mm -hmm. you know, I had lots of people that would yeah, come busy in. Busy or not busy. Yeah, or, and, mm -hmm. and you would say, okay, well, that's one thing to have it in, you know, a restaurant, you're there for an hour and a half, right. you get very overstimulated and mm -hmm. that's part of the mm -hmm. deal. Yeah. But it's another thing to have it in your space. Like, you know yeah. me, I like to have like really bright colors and textures. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Stuff. Yeah. I need to Because you have a creative home. You have a very yeah. creative home. I need we'll to be about, stimulated yeah. by my home. I drink a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. I mean, it relaxes me to be in my home. Yeah. But some mm -hmm. people need chill. Chill. Yeah, they exactly. And I, very yeah. mild. Exactly. And I need a mix and we'll, we'll kind of go into yeah. how that expresses itself. What you were talking about um, kind of challenging landscapes when it comes to creating art. And I was thinking about a show that I went to yeah. in London. That's an um, it's a Spanish artist. Soroya is his name. And he was kind of semi impressionistic. Mm -hmm. in the, but he was a painter of light, not like Thomas Kincaid. Shitty ass. Mm -hmm. of light. He was incredible painter of light. And you know that Spanish light that's so mm. harsh and so hard, and he was glaring. a glaring, and he was a champion at painting that. And you look at some of his paintings close up, and it's just going to be a splash of yellow or a splash Whoa. of white. Like, everything's detailed, and then it's like, bam, there's a splash. But when you stand back, it's exactly right. And you're like, wow. It's yeah, what it, it gives me chills song. when yeah. you think about oh. people that can capture oh, it's that amazing. kind of uh, experience, yeah. you know, that they I can just understand mm -hmm. how to bring that to. Yeah. The, which I love. And so they're clearly very, very, you know, impacted by yeah. it. And so I find that really beautiful that as a creative finding that thing that really yeah. speaks to you and how you're going to express it. So now other than just, um, art, we had touched upon architecture just for mm -hmm. a second. Mm -hmm. Um, we had touched upon like this Palladian stuff, which is monumental and which stands out in the landscape. Yeah. And now we're kind of going towards things that melt into the landscape. And especially like since, you know, the, the 2000s, we've been doing a lot of this green architecture with like mm -hmm. the green walls and the hanging gardens and. And collaborating with nature, yes. lines of nature. Exactly. And, and, and that, sinking yeah. into the ground yeah. and using nature to heat and cool and, you know, not impacting lines of sight and framing certain yeah. views. And I think that that's really interesting. That's something that is kind of novel. And I think it's mm -hmm. significant that we're going yeah. back to nature in terms of how we see our place in it. Yeah. You know, like we were before building these monuments. We still have things like the Salesforce Tower. But we do wow. have, right? What the fuck? But we do have these kind of lead certified, you know, non-impactful designs now that I find fascinating with the green yeah. roofs and the, you know, all Living that stuff. roofs. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Where I, I think that's, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. That, that is, that is a reality now. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then you've got kind of that halfway thing, which is the kind of environmental art. Mm. And environmental art was something that I was thinking about because I had had the opportunity to meet uh, Christo and Jean Claude, you know, mm. the, oh, the, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, next yeah. dog and so I had met them. We had dinner Wait, a while how, back. Really? Yeah. Um, because they came to Columbia University. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't tell me that. Oh. <laughs> what wait, my, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I this is the guy that Prince like Stella like covers like the yeah. whole Brooklyn Bridge and yeah. shit. Like, uh -huh. Yeah. Are you? Fucking yeah. He and his wife. That? Yeah. Bless her heart. Wow. Um, rest in peace. Um. Anyway. So yeah. Wow. We also we also met Frank Stella, and I refused to go to dinner with him. But that's another story for another time. Yeah, but um. Dude. But yeah. So we we had dinner. Uh, with Christo and Jean-Claude, and they were right in the middle of this giant, giant um, installation. Huge. Well, they were in the middle of another installation. They were trying to raise funds for the, um, you know, those portals that they did with the the saffron-colored cloths that they yeah, put yeah, yeah. the park? And yeah. so they were trying to raise... Maybe that's the one that I saw. I saw something so he, when they I was wrapped in the, Yes, it was probably the one in Central they Park. Wrapped, they wrapped the Reichstag. Yeah. 
And then they did all these flags on two hillsides, one in Japan, mm -hmm. one in California. And then, but the one they were having issues with or in the middle of a lawsuit because they had wrapped this island. They'd put this big pink floating plastic thing around entire Ireland uh, islands in Biscayne Bay. In, oh, yeah, Miami. Biscayne. I know where yeah. that is. And so, like, this is something where you're trying to make this environmental art and you're totally fucking up the environment. Yeah. And, you know, so you've got some of that where people are putting invasive species yeah. or cutting into things. So, you know, there's the whole question of using these natural materials to make art and then you're, or not natural materials, and you're trying to impact the landscape. And then, you know, well, what it can about, be a little um, bit. What's his name? Who, I mean, he had a whole installation in San Francisco on the Presidio. Yeah. Well, um, you, had a you had a bunch of them. Yeah. He was, oh, God. Is he, is he I'm a trying Scottish to guy? his name um well you have my daughter was really into him he would build stuff robert smith then no no because um, he did he did remember a bunch he of did stuff. the logs and um and then he he did a i went to his oh why can't i remember his name um, andy goldworthy oh okay okay incredible uh -huh, incredible uh -huh. art but his art is absolutely made to be taken back over by nature so he, nice, he creates nice. a a natural art form like he did in Presidio he did this log it was right. like a yes, serpent yes, yes. And, I know exactly what you're talking about and it was going to like eventually kind of be yeah you know, yeah I then remember. he did that whole mud ceiling in mm -hmm, the um mm -hmm. trying to remember what was in the mud ceiling but there were all these things and it was and it and then it it all dried and cracked. And cracked, yeah. And it was so beautiful. See, that's and awesome. So cool. All about when it's not permanent. And the, the problem and it was with, all yeah. about not being permanent. The problem with Christo's stuff is that he uses these materials that are, you know, pretty synthetic. And so I think that's when it's yeah. it's a big problem. Um, you have like, yeah, all this sites to specific thing I, I thought is really fascinating. The other thing I was thinking of was some of the site specific stuff that we're getting now, which is fascinating, is not just visual. It's not just the experience of being mm -hmm. there. Um, it's the sound bath stuff. Have you been to any of those sound baths? I've heard about them. In fact, uh, I think we need to go to we the need to go. Um, Integratron. Yeah. which is in Joshua Tree. And, and I think that that's kind of fascinating because it's so site specific because it's this dome and it's really, you know, mm -hmm. and Joshua Tree is this total lunar landscape mm -hmm. crazy yeah. thing. And then you I've been go, there one time. Yeah. And then you go and you're just kind of subsumed yeah. by this, this sound. And I think that that's fascinating because sound, you know, has this huge effect. And I'm wondering if you... On your nervous system. On your nervous system. And I'm wondering if you would even bring in smells, for example. Yeah. You know, you just kind of well, have this complete they thing. do that with aromatherapy. I mean, yeah, it's definitely... Absolutely. That's a yeah. way of shaping your environment. Yeah. With, you know, I mean, I will often put a couple drops of oh, some totally. kind of aromatherapy mm -hmm. in my bath. And it just... Whoop, it, changes, changes, it changes everything. Or changes like scented candles. Like, you yeah. know, you can really turn your whole ambiance around and I think that that's major speaking of candles like that's another thing in terms of your indoor environment yeah. not your outdoor environment is you know the quality of the light and everything else we so now that we've kind of gone over I mean there's so many more things that we can say yeah about environment and the way that you know we were represented as well, creative the, yeah we're shaped by it but. yeah I think it's I think it's one of those things that has always been you know, it's been a human. It's been a passion. factor for yeah. me. And yeah, well, for all of it. Yeah, as a creative, and it's not even something that I am that conscious of all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, you get ideas from your from your landscape, Constantly. And, I, and I think it's something to turn to if you are having you know any kind of creative struggle. Oh my god! Yeah, going outside, going running, out, yeah. and thinking about. How do I fit into my landscape? What does yeah. it mean to me? How does it stimulate me? And mm -hmm. is there a particular landscape yeah. that I am compelled by? Right. You know, yeah. some people like to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. people like to go to the mountains. Yeah, the beach is it. You know, a lot yeah. of people are drawn to certain to certain things and landscapes. That's and that's fine. Like, I think don't fight that. Like, when yeah. you're, you know, if you're a creative who's like, I'm fed by the beach. And somebody's like, oh, you're such a loser. You don't like the mountains. And you're like, no, I don't like the mountains. And then you sound like an yeah. asshole. And you're like, why? have the strength to just be like, Hey, I'm going to explore this whole beach shit. That's what inspires me. That's what inspires me. Yeah. And you know, we're adults here. We know enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that's so I'm going to give you guys a few quick and dirty tips on how to make your environment more creative and how to make, you know, yeah. So here's an interesting all, thing. Have a drink. Have a drink. Have a, that actually helps. Like having yeah. a drink 
is a great thing. Like having a drink is actually part of making your space more comfortable. Mm. And so comfort's important in your space. Yeah. So um, just to break it down quickly, like you want the right light levels, you want the right temperature. And you're going to be surprised, actually, because, and first of all, and and you know how you, a lot of people think zen? For creativity, messy um, spaces are better. I don't think zen. No. See, your space is very creative. You have a lot of shit going on <laughs> in your space, and that is really, really good. For me, my space is a little bit less messy in spots, but I have weird shit in it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I've got fish on one wall. I've got these paintings that change all the time. I've got you know, this random, you know, candle, I've got this weird artwork. Yeah. And that is actually what helps is to have these bizarre things, like to have these elements that are a little bit incongruous yeah. in the space. Like if your space is overly harmonious and overly designed, you're not going to have any moment where people are gonna be like, huh, you know, that no, we're gonna going to catch here. your attention. I right. mean, that's what creativity is about is stopping and be like, what? You know, yeah. what was that? Like I have this weird taxidermy deer in Virginia and I'm a taxidermy duck too. I know it's very bizarre and they're both wearing jewelry and it's super strange, but like, that's the thing where people are like, huh? And that's a little creative moment right. that they have. Another interesting thing is switch your, sh- like switch your space up. Yeah. I do that. Like if your space and, and like Linda, for example, you know, friend of podcast, Linda does that a lot. Like she yeah. moves all her shit around constantly. Yeah. The more you like move, and it doesn't have to be a ton of stuff. Yeah, it changes the it changes the flow. It changes the flow. I, mean, I, yeah. I do little things like that all the time. Yeah, like we talked about feng shui and like yeah. changing that energy a little bit. Get the flow, you know. Yeah, get the move flow the moved up, or like just to have something else to look at mm-hmm. or have a different different like point of view once in a while. Yeah, that's major. So I was talking about well, we talked about noise. We talked about sound. So when you want to be creative, having an ambient kind of mid level noise is good Mm -hmm. Um, because it's funny. The psychology of it is your brain works just a little bit harder to focus Mm, to focus and working just a little bit harder. That little tiny hitch in the processing actually makes you work harder and then look for other solutions. So you will think more creatively, but if the noise is too much, it's going to break down. And if there's no noise, you know, no effect. Then we think about the light Mm-hmm. You know, so when we do our podcast, we have this bright fucking light, oh, which is not bad because bright light is good for focusing. However, for creativity, dim lights. I think you knew this already. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I do a lot of, I do, I have a lot of lamps, mm-hmm. but some of them are bright. Spots, some yeah. of them are yeah. dim. Yeah. yeah and I just adjust the lighting to Always. the mood. See, that's great. Mood light. That's, I think that's why they say mood lighting. Mood it could lighting. be called like creativity lighting. Yeah. I think so. Dim light is meant to kind of make you make less safe decisions mm. sometimes. And so that's why like nightclubs, bars, happy My hour. My boyfriend, he's yeah. like, let's turn the lights down. Down, down make make another drink. Less, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah sexy like, time. Right? That's what that is. You get more risky. Sexy lighting. Yeah, you Makes take you more risks. Yeah, and you that, get more slutty. That's you get more slutty, and you get more slutty with your creativity. Creative sluttiness. Creative sluttiness is a goal. Yeah, it's like good, that. right? That's really good. Yeah. And like then that. speaking of getting naked, cranking the heat up. Actually good. If you're cold at all, your creativity... And you're I, I don't do it. I don't do the cold. I don't do the cold thing. No, cold not as either. bad. Cold is bad. I so, make pots of tea and I yeah. turn the heater on. Yeah. So 77 degrees and up is actually 77. 77 degrees. Oh, fuck that. I don't do 77. Isn't that hot? That's it's hot. hot as hell. You I know. Need to, you I know. have to get in your bathing suit and cruise. Please. Yeah. Let's just, we could do like finger painting in our bathing suits. Imagine. Can you imagine? That'd be so cool. We could do that. But yeah, 77 is actually like the peak creative temperature. Seven. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's 25 degrees Celsius. I don't do the Celsius shit. Well, I, I'm pretending to do numbers. I love it. Feeling so creative. Uh, and then in terms of creative colors in mm. your space, blue and green is supposed to be more creative but i mean we all know that there are exceptions to that you've got mm. bursts of kind of got, colors yeah, everywhere I do. which is super cool we, we talked about um we talked about feng shui and colors and stuff right. like that as well and here's an interesting thing when you um when you are in a space like a lot of these creative spaces that mm. silicon valley tries to create they try to make like all these playgroundy type atmospheres and right. they think it's going to be more creative the thing that they mess up on, the thing that they do well is that they encourage through their space, first of all, they have snacks and drinks. 
Drags. Drags. Important. Very important. Yeah. No joke. It is. They also increase the chances for serendipitous personal encounters. So, you right. know, beyond the water cooler, like you're going to meet. You're going to go meet, have a coffee. You're going to go have a you're coffee. Gonna some randoms. You're going to be sitting in some weird swinging chair that they have and you're going to meet some people. And that's awesome for creativity. However, these environments, they've, they've paid somebody gazillions They're of dollars. They're too contrived. They're too contrived and they stay too much the same. So it kind of ends up backfiring. It seems like you'd want to have, I mean, you can hire me if you want. But, yeah, we can hire um, my guy. <laughs> but it seems like you'd want to have like, a, it, it's kind of like in my cupboard, I have lots of, I don't have matching coffee cups. Right. I right. have like unmatching coffee cups with different mm -hmm. textures, different colors. They, they're more interesting. Yeah. It seems like you'd want to have a variety objects like that that Absolutely. could be moved around. Absolutely. For sure. For and, sure. And, and. People could kind of create the space as they feel yeah. in, inspired. Absolutely. And, and that's why you're welcome. You're welcome. And that's why nature changes. That's why people are endlessly fascinated by nature because yeah. you've always got something the tide new that's, going in. The exactly. Tide coming something out. New the tide, yeah. Yeah. New light conditions. Something yeah. that's blooming it's here. Raining, something that it's there. snowing. It's exactly. Flowing. So so look at your environment. Look at nature to see how you can make your environment a little bit more. Interesting. Know, interesting. A little bit yeah. more intriguing, a little bit more inspirational. And let us know how your environment. Yeah, let us know. How it feeds how it's your going. creativity. How it goes. And we enjoyed this. This so was all right. Bad. I, I mean, had a little bit of a headache from we, it. We didn't finish it. So whatever. I mean, I but usually drank it down, but it was do. kind of it was kind of heavy intense. It, it, it had bit. a little bit of like it had a little kick. It had a little paint thinner in it. It had thing. a little bit of vinegar paint thinner. I agree. Yeah. I agree, but but feel free to have this. We got it at Trader Joe's. Yeah, Trader Joe's. The Duchess. The Duchess. Sour cherry. Sour cherry. Sour. Sour. Uh, that's it, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you. Cheers. Next time.